it's uh, three minutes past 11, so uh, let, let's go forward with the meeting. So, uh, first thing is uh, thanks very much indeed, uh, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and uh, hopefully we, we, we can get through this without any technical hitches. Um, so, uh, so thanks again. Um, first of all, can I uh, ask if there are any declarations of interest from any members? So, if you could flag now, please. Okay, no, no declarations of interest. So, let's move forward to um, item three, which is the uh, minutes of the previous meeting. So, uh, the meeting held on Friday, the 12th of June, so 2020. So, if I can just go through the pages for um, any comments or amendments. Uh, page one. Two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, any, any changes? Yeah. Chris, Chris just, just a minor one on 10.4. Mm -hmm. I think that should be KB. I think, it's, I think it was me um, yeah. made that comment about shared ownership of risk on across COVID, it's a yes. guy's KV, and I don't think there is a KV. No, it's there isn't. It's very minor. No, no, well, let's get it right, let's get it right. Uh, it should, you, you, uh, you, are, you are right, Kevin, that was, uh, that was my typo, which I noticed after the papers had gone out. I do apologise for that. No worries. Okay, well, thanks for the uh, correction, so if we can just uh, make that. Um, any other points for the minutes? Uh, otherwise, can we accept okay. them as being... Just, sorry, sorry, Chris. Um, yeah, um, it's been pointed out that um, the thanks that were, were um, offered by the committee to Gareth Sutton um, have been missed off the bottom as well, so we can um, we, we can get that amended as well. Good. Okay. Yes, let's record that. Um, that's fine. So that, uh, that that can go on, and then uh, and then that completes the minutes. Um, can I uh, just pick up the actions in the minutes? Um, the uh, first action was to. Um, Invite the uh, strategic rail team to uh, to the, this meeting um, to present the uh, rail plan. Um, so uh, that's on the agenda. So that, that covers that action point. And then um, also uh, final action point was just to send out the dates for the future meetings this financial year. Um, and that's as far as I'm aware has been done. Okay. Um, so that's uh, minutes. So if we can move. Um, straight on to item four then, uh, monthly operating report, and I think Ian, you're just going to take us through that. Yeah, um, as, as previously, um, I'm gonna, I wasn't going to necessarily go through in, uh, in, in any particular detail. Um, it's, it's quite a, a, a detailed report, and it will take quite a long time to, to take people through it. So um, really, it's just a, an opportunity for, for taking questions, um, if anybody's got any, any points they want to raise or queries on, on what's in the report. Okay. Any 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 No, everybody uh, happy with the with the points in there? Yeah. Okay. Um, don't think we've got any questions, Ian. Anything particular that uh, you want to bring out? Um, I don't. I don't think so, Chair. The, the um, there's going to be another report out. Um, which will go onto the website and be circulated within, within the next few few days covering June. Um, yeah. um, I think um, I don't think there's anything there's anything specific in here that that I that I draw people's attention to. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, let's um, in that case uh, move on to uh, the uh, item five, which is the operational rail recovery. Uh, have we got David with us to? to take us through that. Hi there, you've got um, Salim Patel um, substituting for David Hogarth today. Oh, welcome, um, Steve. Yeah. I, I, have got a, I have got a presentation that I wanted to share, if that's, um, if that's okay with people. Uh, no, that's great. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go with it. All right, I'll just... Um, you just give me a couple of seconds. Yeah, that's fine, yeah.
Can everyone see that? Yeah, yeah. I can see it. Right. Yeah, that's all good to me. That means we made a good start then. All right, okay. Then. Um, if we just, I'll just try and um, put it into presentation mode instead. Uh, okay, does that make things a little bit easier? Yeah, good to me. Thank you. All right, okay then. Um, so um, I'll just run through the presentation quickly and happy to take um, questions as I'm going along, to be honest. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to uh, make sure this fits right. Okay, so um, obviously we've... Uh, we, uh, Covid has meant that we've um, we've had to completely change the way things are working at the moment. Right now, and we've seen that um, the operators have moved into what are essentially management uh, arrangements instead, um, and it's quite a shock to the system. So we need to start thinking about how we rebuild confidence as a result of this. Um, during lockdown, as we've already talked about at previous meetings already, um, we, we we moved into a sorry, I'm just going to close the window. There's an ambulance going past. Um, yeah, we 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 we've moved um, as TFN um, to to really react into that lockdown, looking at how we can bring the industry closer together. And at previous meetings, um, we we've talked about how we worked with the industry through what we call the North of England Contingency Group uh, to put in place what were key worker timetables, um, looking at um, looking at uh, something that was reliable and punctual. And in, uh, I suppose the bigger picture at the moment right now is things are working quite well and performance is looking good at the moment right now. Um, this this diagram you've probably all seen before, um, really bringing together the, the the people who run the railway, Northern TP uh, Network Rail, um, and then uh, from the, on the other side of things, um, on the other handle we call the FA Cup handle, I suppose. Um, uh, the, uh, the, various... the, uh, the slide hasn't actually moved on for us. Well, has it not moved on? Um, has that worked? Yeah. So, okay. Um, I, I, yeah, on the left-hand side, you've got the, the various stakeholder groups, and they, they all come together on a week-by-week -week basis. Um, it's a really good opportunity, uh, which TFN chairs this meeting, to bring together the various stakeholders and the operators, uh, and, and to run thing, uh, through things um, um, almost uh, proactively and also reactively as well, uh, and iron out any issues um, that, that might appear um, at, that, at that point instead, um, and really, uh, really run through things. And I mean, it's every Wednesday and it's really working very well. Uh, and the attendance that we get from both operators and from um, from network really is at director level. And they make the time for this meeting because they see great value in it. Um, I suppose the, the and the benefit is really seeing itself across the industry. We've now got cross country on the call. Uh, we're also looking at getting TFW on the call now as well and East Mid. So um, it, it's really seen as a as a really good mechanism um, um, to to engage with stakeholders um, on a weekly basis. Um, uh, and uh, we we see this continuing for the, for the foreseeable. It might change in the future once COVID COVID um, COVID recedes. Um, but we really see this as a forum that will continue in some in some format. Um, has that moved on to key concerns? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, so uh, last time we met, um, we said there was a risk that the messaging uh, might stigmatise the use of public transport um, and rail levels. Um, we're starting to see an increase slightly, but it's still very, very low at the moment right now. It's probably sitting at somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of normal levels. So it's very clear that this, uh, this probably a very, uh, there is a big mountain to climb yet. Um, the longer term risk um, to the railway. And to the economy and to the climate and locally is um, how much faith people put in future investment um, and it's probably familiar uh, and a lot of you are probably familiar um, with the graph um, that we've seen at the moment right now very similar in the north um, there's very few people traveling at the moment right now um, not, not enough at the moment right now um, that would um, that would probably uh, justify significant levels of uh, investment at the moment um, and that's based on just the demand is not there so we need to look at how we can build the confidence at the moment right now to get people back on the network when it is safe to do so and it's also worth noting at the moment that um, prior to Sunday's announcement by the Prime Minister, you know, it was a couple of weeks ago, um, things have remained fairly stable. Car use continues to go up at the moment right now, um, and it's probably likely to continue to go up at the moment right now. And we've also seen an increase in active travel as well, um, but rail continues to be fairly low at the moment. Um, move on to the next slide. 
Um, so I suppose the coming weeks now is um, can really looking at what you know the, the present challenges and how we navigate the balancing act um, of safe supply and demand while uh, considering what, how social distancing is really gonna um, really gonna start impacting on things. So we've uh, we've already seen things start to relax down from two meters to one meter already, um, and operators starting to understand what that means in terms of the level of capacity that they've got within within their uh, within their rolling stock. Um, We've also got to think about how we adapt to things like local lockdowns. Um, obviously, Leicester went into a local lockdown uh, recently, um, uh, and Blackburn is potentially close to a local lockdown, although they are taking preventative action at the moment right now. But um, through forums like the North Union Contingency Group, um, we're, we're able to understand from operators what plans uh, they're, they're drawing up in the event that um, local lockdown does happen, uh, what that means in terms of communications, and how that would, um, how uh, and how they would react in those circumstances. Um, I suppose the real risk at the moment right now is that um, rail usage and demand will take quite a long time to recover due to the current capacity restrictions um, and the reduced confidence of passengers as well. Uh, and that's going to have a lasting financial impact. And it's going to make it much harder to make the case for investment. Um, and I think... Um, I think on Tuesday, members heard speculation that it could take anywhere between um, two to uh, ten years for things to recover back to the, where they were previously before COVID. Um, so the roadmap to recovery. Um, so um, I suppose that what we're trying to do is really look at what we can do within transport for the north um, to 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 really embrace the new ways of working, um, but also within the industry as well. Um, and it really highlights um, where we should be focusing on embrace, and also embracing the positives um, in terms of what we've learned through the lockdown and the areas that we probably need to take care to avoid as we start to recover as well. So I suppose the main points for us are that we want to help rebuild passenger confidence. We want to support positive messaging about rail and public transport. We want to build on uh, the better operational performance that we've seen during the crisis. Um, and we want to support the change in working habits with more flexible ticketing. And we've also, we've already seen Northern this week has, um, uh, has, uh, has um, offered a, a, a brand new flexi season ticket, um, uh, which is going to be running on the Harrogate to Leeds line. Um, and that offering will be um, basically a, a 10 tickets for the price of nine, but they can be used at any time during a six month period. So, I mean, I, at this stage, obviously, just a trial, uh, just to see how the, uh, how, um, the, the customer reacts to that. But uh, absolutely, we're, we're, we're seeing um, organizations, operators, um, starting to, uh, starting to look, test the market in terms of what the new ways of working might look like. Um, building confidence. Um, so a, a huge amount of, uh, of obviously um, operators and network will having to have, having to adjust um, um, what they're doing on their network and in terms of their rolling stock as well. We've I mean face coverings are now mandatory for passengers and staff. And on the whole, we are seeing that um, we are seeing that um, the compliance is quite high. I suppose the, the the weird thing is we we are seeing really really high compliance during the peak period. We're seeing less compliance during the off peak period. So I suppose that's where the challenge is at the moment right now uh, to really um, to build up um, compliance within um, the the non regular traveller. Um, we're also seeing um, additional cleaning regimes going on at the moment right now on trains and stations. That's really about building confidence within within passengers to come back. Uh, measures at stations at the moment right now on trains to support social distancing. Um, but we're also seeing a lot more accountability being pushed onto the passenger as well. So, for example, Northern um, this week removed all the seat coverings um, that were being used to socially distance passengers. Two reasons for that. Firstly, because passengers were ignoring them and, and sitting wherever they wanted. But secondly, because it really pushes the responsibility onto the passenger and the customer to, to, to take into account that they need to socially distance themselves. Um, and um, and um, I suppose that forms part of um, the responsibility of general public. Um, 
one of the things that we in the industry they are welcoming at the moment right now is um, face coverings being um, being made mandatory or in shops um, because that means that um, they become the norm uh, and if people are more likely to wear them in the shops and they are more likely to wear them on the trains as well so we're, we're, we're definitely welcoming that as um, as a as a positive thing for the industry as well um, Rail off committee. We had rail off committee two days ago, um, at which we had um, Anna Jane Hunter um, from Network Rail, Richard George, um, Anne McDonough from, from Northern on OLR, and Louise Ebbs um, from TPE, um, and they all agreed that um, performance and reliability at the moment, right now, which has been fantastic and has been very very good um, during this period, remains the top priority when it comes to bringing services back into the network again. And we're, I mean, this has been an extraordinary year. Normally, we have two timetable changes a year, May and December. I think this year has had five already, so it shows the demands um, on the people who've got to plan these timetables um, and and the operators as well. Um, but I think they've done a good job in terms of uh, in terms of highlighting the areas that they need to bring back um, to support key workers and also to support the economy as well. Um, at the moment, right now, TP are running at around about 83% um, in terms of um, in terms of the amount of services that they are running compared to pre-COVID. Um, Northern. A little bit less than that, around about 67%, but they are looking at starting to increase that back up by September at the next timetable change um, when, um, when uh, with schools going back, obviously. Um, TB will probably stay around about the same in September, that's based on their resource levels. Um, Members also agreed that um, government must continue to support its commitment to the north and also work to address the cost of carrying um, carrying fresh air around basically because um, the trains are very very empty empty and the cost to the treasury is probably about ten times um, what their previous uh, what they previously used to cost before. Um, so um, that's definitely something that remains high on the agenda. Um, Richard George was also there on the call as well, and he was there to talk about um, um, their current preparation works in terms of the uh, the management agreements coming to an end in September, um, and just uh, just making sure uh, and the fact that they are keeping an eye on talks to make sure that they're not going to fall off a cliff all at once. So um, definitely something that uh, remains on their agenda at the moment right now. Um, and so also, also there's some real concerns about the psychological impact of the lockdown at the moment right now and the appetite for real travel. And TFN is really working at the moment right now to, uh, with uh, through the contingency group, looking at the messages that is coming out from RDG to look at um, to look at how we build that confidence back onto the network as well. Um, Councillor Blake, um, one of our committee members, also won widespread support for her plea for strong and consistent messaging that reaches the people that matter and sticks with them as well. Um, we've all we've already seen a softening of the message um, on the network, um, where you know um, we're, we're going down to one meter already, and that's really um, about pushing uh, pushing confidence um, um, to uh, to get people to return to the network as well. I will take questions at the end of the presentation. This is the last slide. Um, I suppose while the challenge of the balancing act will remain, there is agreement that um, safe rail capacity should be utilised and be encouraged. Some of the trains are very, very empty at the moment right now, and there is capacity at the moment right now for um, additional passengers to go onto the network. Um, so we just want to make sure that we don't scare those passengers away for good. Um, we're expecting the, to the government to soften its message further imminently. Um, and I suppose with the mandatory wearing of face cover coverings in shops also about to be introduced um, and the hope that public compliance will become the norm as well, as I've previously said already. Uh, we almost see it a bit like seatbelts, to be honest with you, um, seatbelts wearing them in cars. I think face masks are move, moving in that direction as well. Um, Industry is also now gearing up for some September rail season. Everything is pointing to uh, a rail push towards the economy getting back to normal in September. Schools are opening back up, universities are opening back up. Um, we're hoping international students will um, will um, come back as well. Um, and we also expect September to see an increasing number of white collar workers starting to return to offices as well. So it all feels like everything is kind of moving towards that fourth of September date, um, and that's kind of uh, that's kind of um that's 
that's reinforced by the fact that we're, we're expecting to see a, a good timetable offering in September as well. Um, this is all against the backdrop of a, a, room, a railway that is running very, very, very well at the moment right now. Um, and I suppose the real risk at the moment right now is we don't we don't want to end up going over the tipping point where performance starts to um, starts to decrease um, as we start to put services back in. So we're really really careful at the moment right now to make sure that we've got some strict tests in place uh, to make sure that when services go back in, they're not going to have a big impact on performance because passengers that are travelling at the moment are getting used to the performance as it is at the moment, uh, and we think a big attractor of people coming back will be good performance on the network. Um, so, so we want to be absolute. We are, so we are working very, very closely at the moment right now with um, with operators to make sure that when things enter back into the network, they either do meet stringent tests. Um, I'd say the north so far has met the challenge well. Um, we need to mitigate against any risks that we're going to get in the autumn season um, and the challenges that will bring as well. Um, and continue to put the right tests in place as, uh, as well to make sure that performance stays um, at the correct levels. Um, happy to open up for any questions at this stage. I can't see any hands up, but um, I don't know. I, I, um, is there any questions from anyone? Keith Little? You're on mute, Keith. Yeah, I'm out now. Yeah, thank you, Salam, for um, what was a very uh, uh, thorough presentation there. Uh, and I know you referred and you were obviously listening to the uh, Rail North meeting earlier this week that Liam chairs. I just wanted to raise the same point, really, that... Um, you know, we know that um, footfall is around 10 to 15 percent, and um, that was the message we got on Monday as well. And yet the government are asking the talks to provide extra services, and um, inevitably this is going to be uh, an increasing cost um, on, on, uh, well, on the Chancellor, I am assuming, because they're picking up the revenue costs. And I just think that as as people start to pick up and go back to public transport, as they will inevitably, that the TOC should be able to make those decisions as to where services need to be improved, rather than just having an uplift, a general uplift. Um, I know on the West Coast, uh, the Cumbrian uh, coastal line, uh, trains are going up and down almost every hour, and there is just the two people, the driver and the conductor, who are travelling, and that's been the same now for, for 15 or 16 weeks. There is very little demand uh, on these kind of uh, rural lines, uh, and I suspect it's the same on the main lines. I had family down in London at the weekend, and from Carlisle down to London, almost a complete empty train, and, and the same in the city. Uh, stations empty. So, you know, it, it, it is a conundrum that government are asking for uplifts from the uh, from the providers, and yet passenger numbers are showing nowhere near that demand. Thanks very much indeed, Bert. Um, I, I think it's a very very good point, Keith. Um, I think. I think it's a tough balancing act. On the one side, you've got um, there's a real need to to get passengers or when, when, when to really build confidence for passengers to go back onto trains, and part of that is to demonstrate the trains are running. But also the the other side is that um, a lot of the costs built into the railway are fixed costs already, so we have to pay for the drivers, we have to pay for the trains they already exist. But we're talking about potentially the fuel costs, um, which is additional. Um, so um, I, I, and I think part of what the operators have said, the reason why they need to keep those trains on the network is that when demand starts to build back up, we, they need to make sure that their drivers have uh, retained driver knowledge, route knowledge, all that kind of stuff. And what they don't want to do is for their drivers to lose that and then demand picks back up and then they have to go through a training regime which potentially could impact on performance in the future. So I think that's part of the rationale behind why some of those trains are still running on the network right now. Um, um, I, I think the key thing now is really to try and build passenger confidence back so that um, come September we're starting to see demand start to rise far quicker than it probably has done inside the last couple of weeks. Um, Kevin Brady? Uh, yes, so, uh, thanks for, uh, for, for that presentation, really helpful. Um, I, I just wonder, is there, is there a, a sort of a, a work stream in the recovery 
uh, planning around challenging some of the assumptions that you um, you outline. So my, my, I'm thinking particularly around demand levels and um, uh, and the the, the, the assumption that we bring passenger levels back to pre-COVID levels, even if it takes five to ten years. There's quite a lot of sort of thinking, if you like, an opinion at the moment that that actually um, we're not going to return to a pre-COVID normal attending point in the future. Uh, so we have to start thinking about and talking about new the new normal as, as the, as the, uh, as, as the language uh, permits. Um, and, and certainly a, a number of sectors that I'm involved in outside of transport um, are already, you know, making decisions, you know, about um, assets and agile and home working, et cetera, and flexi working. So the likelihood of passenger uh, levels coming back to pre-COVID, certainly from what I can see, is, is pretty, on the, pretty much on the unlikely scale. So I suppose my, my question was really about, you know, are, are you doing that sort of what if, what if they don't um, return to pre-COVID levels? Are you doing that sort of scenario planning? Are you stress testing those? And then backtracking to what does that mean for strategic uh, business cases, et cetera, et cetera? Within our team, um, within Strategic Pro, we're, we're currently doing a bit of we are doing some demand forecasting at the moment right now to look at some what if scenarios in terms of what would happen. Um, it's still very much in the early stages at the moment right now because it's very, di I mean, it's very difficult to understand what the assumptions are going to be um, going forward. But there is some, there is some initial work going on at the moment right now. Um, I know similarly within the department, there's also work going on right now um, looking at. Um, various scenario levels in terms of whether you know 70% whether it was a 70% or a 60% return come you know a year's time compared to pre-COVID levels um, and also changes in behaviour as well so I think potentially what you might find as a result of this and what needs to be modelled and probably will be modelled soon is if there is a change of behaviour where um, working times may become staggered instead um, or if there is a, or if there is a, an increased appetite for things like um, a different fare structure, I think we might, what we will start to see is a lot more of these offerings potentially being considered in the future. Um, in terms of assets and stuff, I think, I think you're right. I, I know the DFT is currently looking at the rolling stock portfolio, rolling stock portfolio in terms of um, how that might need to be distributed in the future and what it might mean for new rolling stock procurement in the future as well. But again, because um, I think everyone is still very much in the reality phase at the moment right now not, not none of that has really been um, progressed in any level of detail and I'd probably expect to see that kind of starting to come to fruition in the in the autumn winter time um, councillor Brewis thank you I think a lot of which already been said but um we're in such an uncertain time at the moment that forecasting is almost impossible. And it seems to me that if we want to attract, attract and persuade people to return to the network, it's going to require the Treasury to take a drastic decision to reduce fares by almost astronomical levels. Um, now, whether they would do that, but it's a possibility so that it becomes so obviously more economically attractive to travel by public transport than to take the car out. And at the moment, that marked difference isn't there. And it seems to me we need a dramatic national statement of some sort, which will ensure that it's more attractive to use public transport. That's a personal view. Um, I, I think it's, it's definitely a valid view. Um, I think at this stage, it probably until um, the government is confident that um, they can confidently uh, allow masses of people to enter onto public transport. I don't think we'd probably get any radical solution yet, um, but potentially we are talking uh, something, uh, maybe something radical is required in the future to bring um, confidence back onto the network. And I think that we, we've all talked about how we think the fair structure is currently outdated. Um, maybe that's where we start. Any more questions or um, shall I hand back to the chair? 
Okay, Salam, so, um, it looks like there's no more questions. So thank you very much indeed for that very helpful, informative uh, update there. Thank you. All right, so that takes us uh, on to uh, item six now, um, external audit update. Uh, if we could uh, ask Karen to, uh, to update us with that. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you. Um, we have presented for you here a draft audit completion report that set out the position as at um, probably last week when, when papers came out. Um, to update members, really, the, the report says that there is some work still outstanding. Um, the majority of that work is now complete, but the bit that isn't complete, the two things that are kind of um, fairly big issues, really, which are which are causing some problems, is that we have yet to get any assurance from the pension fund auditor, the Great Manchester Pension Fund, in respect of the uh, transactions relating to your defined benefits liability scheme, uh, which is the IS19 uh, entries in your account. And we are also still working with your finance team uh, to resolve some issues around the way in which you've accounted for the intangible assets relating to IST phase three. Um, neither of those issues is likely to be resolved in the short term. So what Ian and I uh, discussed yesterday and, and are proposing now is that we park this issue for now and we bring back a completion report with a new set of accounts that reflects all of those issues uh, as properly complete to a later meeting. You'll be aware, I think, that the um, deadline for financial reporting for uh, public bodies like yourselves, as well as for audit as a consequence, has been changed this year in order to, to uh, allow for the impacts of the pandemic. Um, so you were required previously to have your account ready by the 31st of May for audit by the end of July. That's changed now so that your accounts are need to, didn't need to be ready until the 31st of August for audit by the end of November. And actually, given where we are now, you're in a really, really good position because your accounts were ready on time. They were to a very high quality. And the issues that are preventing us from moving forward with them are largely technical um, and in terms of the pension funds, largely outside of our control as well. So um, from a governance perspective, just to reassure you, though, there is nothing that you need to be particularly concerned about. We haven't identified any significant issues during the course of the audit. Um, and as I say, the work is, is on track, more or less complete, save for those two uh, substantive points. Is that helpful? Do you want me to provide any more information at this stage? Well, uh, from my point of view, I think it's just worth making clear then at, at this point um, about uh, how we go forward uh, with uh, with our recommendations to the board. Um, clearly, um, until um, we have that uh, additional, I guess, um, technical issue resolved from an audit point of view, it makes it difficult for us as a, um, a committee to um, take this to the next board. Now, as you've already pointed out, um, we're in uh, unusual circumstances where the deadlines have actually moved, been moved out. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we're not really under a lot of pressure to, to necessarily take it to that board. So um, I just want to open this up to the committee, really, um, to see whether or not um, we're happy as an organisation now to um, postpone that recommendation into the September board. Um, and um, what that would, of course, mean is that we would need another meeting uh, prior to the September board to um, just to sign that uh, recommendation off. So um, uh, that probably would mean us having a meeting on um, third, Thursday, the 3rd of September um, to give enough time for um, for the board, which I think meets um, mid, mid September. It might be the 16th. I can't just remember. Um, for, uh, for the process uh, to run through. But even then, of course, that's um, well within the, uh, the guidelines. So, uh, first of all, I just um, wanted to open that up to the floor and see whether or not anybody um, had got any problems with that. Uh, got Keith. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. No, I think... Uh, you know, to us, fully explained to us, uh, it's not, uh, it's a technical issue rather than a financial issue. Uh, and I'd be happy to support your recommendations that we, uh, if, if it's going to be required, have an earlier meeting in September um, and take it forward from there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Keith. 
All right. So um, going back to um, going back to you, Karen. Um, so in in your uh, view, do you think things will be uh, sorted out by then? Um, I hope so, not least because I'm the auditor of the pension fund that you're waiting for information from. So uh, I guess it, to some extent it's in my own hands, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I've now got the accounts for the pension fund, which is a, a step forward because obviously we've, we've only just recently received them. So our work is underway, so I don't anticipate a problem. We're working very hard with your finance team around the um, minor uh, issue of the accounting for the um, uh, intangible asset. Um, it, to be to be clear, we are very happy with that uh, this is a technical matter and not something that will affect the financial position um, ultimately. So this is really about capital accounting, which is quite niche uh, and quite complex. So we're working with, with Ian and Paul and the team to resolve that as quickly as we can. Um, I don't know if Ian wants to come in on the back of that. Um, I think Paul's just put his hand up as well, Chair. It might be... Paul? Should, we take, should we take Paul first? He put his hand up. So yeah, okay. Th thank you for thank you for acknowledging my hand. Um, yeah, yeah, and just reiterating Karen's point is it, it is a, we are talking about the pension fund audit is out of our hands and that's just uh, that will run its due course and and um, uh, but it's worth noting that we do have a, a statutory um, override which would you know whatever valuation comes out of the pension fund we've got the ability to reverse it within the account so it would have uh, no effect. So it is a, it is a I suppose a technical point in relation to the um, the intangible discussion that, that Karen mentioned. We are talking about a, 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 a quite a fine, a quite a, an obtuse uh, technical debate, and it's about disclosure within a set of accounts. But they need to be correct, and um, we, we know we have we have had technical advice from uh, from professional advisors, and but it's not an exact science. Um, so there is a debate going on now between our professional advisors. And the orders as to what is the correct disclosure, and that's all it is. And we're happy that 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 that, that, that debate will run its due course, and we will uh, present the most, um, we'll present the correct position that is um, that will result in a, what well, we would hope, result in a, in a clean audit report. I don't believe there's any risk of that happening in, in relation to these matters. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, Ian, did you want to add anything? No, I think I think both Karen and Paul. I won't I won't repeat what, what what's been said, um, Chris. Um, I think it would be we'll get something if, if if that's okay with the with everybody on the committee we'll get a a, a shorter meeting put in for the um, beginning of September um, so we can we can um, formally approve the account so that it can go to the board which I think from memory is on the, the 17th of September um, and if there's any if anything emerges in the meantime we'll, we'll let people know i mean i think the intention would be that once we've got an agreed set of accounts we can circulate it to the committee anyway regardless of, of exactly when that is so people have got got plenty of time to have a have a look at it okay that's that's fine and um, anything else karen you want to to say no nothing at all really other than um my usual comments about the accounts having been prepared to a very good standard and the working papers were were good um, and we've had lots of cooperation from your finance team. And as Paul says, when, when we get into um, nuanced debates about complex capital accounting things, then, um, you know, there's, there's, there's always the opportunity for other teams and finance teams to fall out. But actually, this is a good natured, um, highly technical debate that my team are having with yours. So uh, everything's fine from my perspective. Very good. That all sounds uh, excellent. And um, thanks, team, for uh, for working that through. Um, any uh, any further points for Karen? If if not, we'll uh, we'll move on. No, thank you, thank you very much, Karen. Um, so that takes us to item seven: year end statutory accounts. Um, Chair, if I may, I think I think we've probably we've covered the the, the, the matter really. I think in the in the previous item, you know, in that there are uh, two two technical uh, you know, the pension fund. And there's a, a disclosure of intangible assets um, and some um, some style and presentation points that will that we process through the accounts and they'll they'll be re represented in due course. I mean the the accounts that uh, the the present format of the accounts are in the pack, uh, but I would suggest it would make more sense if we uh, would um, defer any review until we we reissue the the final set of accounts and then and obviously take take members through the changes from what they saw previously. Oh, okay, Paul. Yes, um, we uh, we had quite an extensive session on the accounts at the previous uh, meeting, so um, 
uh, I guess we don't need to replay all of that. Um, and um, like you say, it seems sensible to uh, to just review the, the changes um, uh, when we come to do that in September. Um, so, but before we leave the council, I just want to give the uh, committee an opportunity if there are any particular questions that uh, anybody has at the moment on the on the accounts. No, no, I think uh, I think we're okay to to move on. Okay, well, thanks uh, thanks for that, Paul. Um, if we can um, now move on to item eight, the internal audit report, and uh, have we got Lisa with us? It's uh, Andy here from RSM. Hi, Hi Andy. Can I give a, can I just give a quick update. So since the committee met in June, the, the there isn't any further completed audit reports to discuss. So it was just a quick update on where we're up to. So there are two audit assignments currently taking place, which are in progress, which relate to the contract management and the follow-up review. The follow-up review was actually brought forward a bit on the basis that all the actions from last year are now past their completion data. We thought it'd be a good opportunity to do that review now remotely while I've got the opportunity. So they're both near completion. We're just waiting on a, a couple of final bits of, of evidence for both of them reviews, and then we'll be able to issue our draft report. So they're both in progress. The next couple of reviews coming up are in September. We've got um, a few in September to the um, uh, payment system and, uh, so, and uh, the flexi time and HR one. So, again, just to give you an update on how we're operating, we're still carrying out all our audits remote. Um, to my knowledge, across our client base, we've only had one request for, or, for us to come on site, which is from a school. And obviously that's subject to a lot of risk assessments. But as far as I'm aware, for yourselves, we'll continue to carry out them audits in September remotely. So um, happy to take any questions, but it's just an update on where we're up to with the plan. OK, any, anybody got any questions? Thank you. OK. No, no, I think uh, I think everybody's uh, happy with the plan, um, which we've discussed before. So um, <clears throat> we'll um, let's we'll let you go on that and uh, move forward if we can to the um, item nine, the draft corporate risk register. And uh, how do you with us? Yes, chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, chair. So the Ian submitted and presented the draft corporate risk register in June, the last meeting. And I believe there were two points that were raised for TFN to consider and adopt or, or update the, risk, the, the corporate risk register. So at the moment we have, as it stands, we have about 10 corporate risks that the organization is facing and we continue to mitigate and manage the risks. Um, the two points are in relation to, well, the first point was around the, the risk ownership for the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we've reviewed that recommendation for, for it to change to the chief executive, Barry White. We have adopted that recommendation and also we took the report to the operating board for, for, for approval, internal approval. So that point to, to, to say that has been um, incorporated in the corporate risk register. The second point was in relation to the risk, um, the, well, the, the long-term effects of COVID-19 on passenger volumes and how it could possibly impact on TFN's ability to make convincing and compelling rail investment in the north. We've also, we also agree with that point of recommendation and that point, that risk mitigation, or should I say risk implication can be found, um, I think on page 27 in the corporate risk register and it's part of the rail operations, franchise and delivery risk. So we agree that that's a risk that TFN must consider. And I think Salim Patel covered that in his presentation. So we have included that point around the long-term effects of COVID-19. Um, so those were the two main, as far as I am aware, Chair, those were the two main points that were raised in, in the June meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the last one I just want to point out, which we've also 
updated in the Corporate Risk Register is NPR. Um, as you will see, I believe it's on page um, 24, we have expanded and included some uh, three additional risks, uh, which are infrastructure risks. The, the costs remain high and continue to do so, but the team is working, continually working with the right um, organizations, including Network Rail, to assure the costs, the BCRs, and um, VCRs meaning the benefits and cost ratio, ratios um, and the partner engagement. These risks are moving. Um, they continue to be, to be, they're moving every day um, and we continue and, and also developing every day. But we, we continue, or should I say the program continues to, 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 to work on in mitigating this, these risks to make sure that hopefully we'll have um, we're working on improving and enhancing the models to have a better BCRs um, to ensure that we have a, a, a compelling and successful submission in March 2021. Um, clearly, um, there are other risks that we would, I'm sure, in the next meeting, we will come back and update. By then, we'll be in a much more better position to see where we are in terms of sifting the, the, the BCRs and, and the SOC delivery in March 2021. So those were the three main points I wanted to, 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 to raise, um, and I'm happy to, to take any questions. Any questions for Hadi? From anybody? Um, okay. Uh, uh, just a comment, I guess we um, uh, we thought the uh, <coughs> the level of risks were were high and difficult to manage in the, in as shown in the uh, risk register pre COVID, uh, and I guess now with uh, COVID on top of um, you know the uh, uh, the situations we found ourselves pre COVID uh, makes um, managing the uh, the risks even even more difficult. So I guess uh, from our point of view, we need to um, keep a close eye on this. But also, um, uh, and I think Kevin might have mentioned this earlier, um, we um, we do need to keep an eye on on business cases as they flow through system and as they had um, perhaps been. Uh, through the approval process previously, um, just to make sure now that um, those business cases uh, are still um, appropriate. So um, uh, I think uh, as a uh, committee, uh, we need to, um, I guess, be assured that um, the uh, business cases in the system are reflecting the new environment effectively um, uh, so that um, you know, we, we can monitor that. So I guess, I guess from my point of view, I just want to, some sort of reassurance that um, going forward that uh, we are uh, looking at that. Okay, can I bring in Kevin? Okay. Yeah, bring in Kevin there, please. Uh, it was just, just a, a quick thing, really. Uh, I noticed this uh, reference to the development of the insurance framework and also the benefits realisation framework. I just wondered, um, in terms of the timeline for the development of those frameworks, whether it would be appropriate for this committee to have sight at some point? I mean, I think, Kevin, thanks for that question. I think if I can, Ian, Ian will know more than me on this one, I'm afraid. Um, so if I can just pass on that question to Ian to, to, to answer that question. Yeah, sure. I think, it, I think the answer, Kevin, is yes, it, it would be appropriate. Um, there have been some, some delays, particularly in the, in, in the assurance framework. Um, but I will, I think it's something that we, we should bring at least a, a, a work in progress um, to you um, at the probably at the, the meeting back end of September, um, uh, just to just to update on on where we're at and to allow um, the, the committee to ask questions of the team. So I will um, if, if if we we will take that as an action and, and add it as an agenda item onto the September board. Sorry, the September audit and governance committee. Um, there has been there has been some progress, but the I don't. 
I'm I'm not aware that it's it's it is complete or or about to be completed just just at the moment. Okay, can I can I bring in Keith there? I think you've got a question, Keith. Yeah, thank you, Chair, <clears throat> and uh, and thanks to uh, Nadi for the uh, for the report. It's just uh, I chaired a meeting of our local um, with our lab representatives and uh, department and uh, Highways England and many others uh, earlier this week, and the, um, the contactless um, uh, rail and local smart ticketing issue was raised, particularly by the uh, the leader of the council and also the lab. Uh, and there was a request that perhaps we could look, uh, Rail Transport for the North could look at working with a particular authority um, just to see if this is a possibility to try and introduce something uh, on, on a smaller scale, just within a particular authority. And I know uh, Liam will remember we talked about Liverpool, we talked about the North East at one point in time to just try and get something off the ground. But it feels, I think, we're going to lose this opportunity uh, if we don't get something uh, sorted fairly quickly. And perhaps working on a on a smaller location might be something we can try. So uh, I, I'm happy to take that back into my, uh, my my authority and see if we can get something to pick it up with uh, with, with the team. Okay. Thank you, Keith. So we're just breaking up slightly there. Um, how do you? Yeah. Can I come back to you? Yes. So, so Keith, thank, thank you for that point. I think I think that um, decision it, it's actually something um, it's higher on my pay grade. I, I must be, be honest. I think I'll leave that to Ian, and hopefully Ian will work work with the new program director for IST, Jeremy Acklam, um, and hopefully they can make that decision and work with you on that. I would also add that it's way way above my pay grade as well. <laughs> um, it's, it's probably worth. I, I I don't know whether it's my internet connection or your Keith, but I was I was um, I was struggling slightly there um, to hear. But I the the team is looking at uh, opportunities at the moment. I had a conversation with with the new IST program director about how to 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 move forward quickly on a, a number of things um, this earlier this week. So um, should I, I'll either pick up with you in the first instance or, or pick up with one of your officers. That might be a, a, a good way to start and, and, and just get, try and get the joining up done within TFN. OK, thank you for that. In. Yeah, I, I'll speak to one of our uh, officers and get our officers to get in touch with yourself. Yeah. OK, okay thank you. Hadi, have you got anything else uh, you want to say at this point? Well, well, Chair, um, I think if, if there are no questions, I, I w just a couple of updates in, in relation to the risk management strategy um, and um, the internal audit, um, just to point out that we are working on updating the risk management strategy to, to reflect um, a point that a recommendation that was um, shared with us by RSM, which is to, it's very small minor thing to include a version control in the risk management strategy so that um, we can actually see for governance reasons what has been updated by when. That's one. I think the second one is also we are looking to improve our risk management practice by moving um, or, or, or developing a five by five. At the moment, we have a four by five four by four risk scoring mechanism, we're looking to move to five by five to have a much more matured and robust risk management process. So we will be working on that and then hopefully we'll bring it to the next meeting to seek approval. Okay, thank you, Harry. Yeah, look forward to that. Um, excellent. Any any final questions for, for Harry? No, no, thank you very much, Eddie. I think uh, we've covered, uh, covered the risk for now. Um, so if I can move on now to item thank 10, you. which is about next committee dates. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we probably now need a, an additional meeting, which we're proposing for the 3rd of September. Um, so before we kind of lock that down, um, can I just take a bit of a poll as to anybody who wouldn't, wouldn't be able to make that? Oh, that's great. So, oh, 
Uh, Liam? Yeah, sorry, I was having difficulty raising my digital hand. <laughs> I'm actually kind of on leave that week, so I wouldn't be able to attend, but obviously kind of uh, that's not the end of the world. OK, uh, thanks for that, Liam. Um, any, anybody else? Everybody else who would be able to attend, it's just we need to make sure we've uh, caught it. Um, uh, just to say, Chris, perhaps we could circulate some times. I've got about four meetings on that day. I'm just back off annual leave. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, it's probably just going to be an half an hour meeting or something like that. So if we can promulgate a few times, I'm sure I'll be able to fit something in. OK, um, in that case, um, uh, I'll, can we can somebody pick that one up and uh, suggest a few for the 3rd of September? And we, try and lock that down. we might need. Agree, agree with Keith. The time is the key thing. Yeah. Um, just then, that's quite important that we actually decide how long it's going to be. Um, Ian, do you think we'll be able to do it in half an hour or uh, will it need to be an hour? Um. I, I, I certainly don't think it, it will be more than an hour. It's probably it's, it's probably 45 minutes at the at the outside. I would have thought. Um, I mean, assuming assuming that that things are um, relatively straightforward, which I don't think we've got any reason to to think that they wouldn't be at the minute. I mean, I suspect it would take less time than that. Um, Councillor Winnington has his hand up. I'm um, just to invite. Just, just a, a quick one, really. Again, with, with I'd agree with Keith. If you could send one or two uh, time slots, and, and uh, it, it always helps the PAs to find out what, what's going on, because people. Keep, I mean, the, the one bad thing about uh, teams is that that you you're quite happily sailing along, and then people put three or four meetings in when you're not looking. So yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, would be appreciated. Thank you. We'll do. Okay. Uh, what, what we'll do um, then, if if. To help everybody, if, if James James can look in at, at, at times, it might work. I mean, I I I think we could be fairly flexible on on time, given that nobody's going to going to need to to travel. So um, yeah, we'll 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 send a series of dates. I'll let I'll let James coordinate that, and then hopefully we can come to to um, a time that's that suits everybody. Obviously, as 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 you've said, Chair, we need to make sure we're core um, in order to, for this to work. OK, thank you. So um, if you take that away, James, thank you very much. Um, and then we've already uh, put in the second meeting in September, which was originally scheduled for Thursday the 24th. So if people could just um, make sure that's um, in the diaries, please. Um, OK, that takes us on to uh, any other business. Uh, would anybody like to raise any other business at this point? OK, uh, it doesn't look like um, we need any other business. So at this point, should we uh, close the meeting? And uh, just to say thank you very much to everybody for attending. Thank you. Cheers.